Hello, you plonkers, and welcome back today to Nine Things We Learned on the True Footy channel. We're back. I think it's round nine. I think. It's round nine. I'm going to go with that. Here we go. Nine things we learned from round nine of the AFL season. Things are changing. Teams are winning. Teams are losing. We're learning a lot. If you're enjoying this series, make sure you leave a like and subscribe if you're new. Comment down below what you've learned from this round as well. And let's get into the video. Side note, sorry I didn't upload last week. I was just too busy. Just simply didn't have time. But we're back with a bang for nine things we learnt for round nine. Let's get this party started, baby. Number one, Richmond swing their season around. You can't take anything away from Richmond in this performance. I know a lot of the narrative is, oh, Geelong, they have lots of injuries. But this was a truly great Tigers performance led by the guys that were the backbone of that dynasty. Cochin, Martin, Rewall, all having massive games to beat the reigning premiers at the MCG on Friday night footy, it was as big as a result gets for Richmond, and it's one that could potentially swing their season around. To think a few weeks ago, including myself, I was bagging them out. Now I'm wearing bloody yellow and black. I'm that big on Richmond. Uh, <laughs> they flogged West Coast, and then they sort of realized, like, right, now we've done a training drill on the Eagles. Let's apply this to an actual football team. And they played themselves into form against West Coast, rediscovered their identity, and had a great win against Geelong at potentially season-defining turning point, I think this is for Richmond. The way they moved the ball by hand from their back half was very impressive. When they can't move the ball cleanly, as they did within that dynasty side, they just surge the ball, just gain territory and cause chaos, which Geelong don't like. Geelong like control. Richmond brought the chaos and had the game played in their terms. Their relentless pressure was immense for four quarters as well. It was a great win. Very good win for Richmond. Number two, Gold Coast belt a woeful West Coast. It's not a surprising result, is it? I mean, West Coast are about as valuable as a fart in the wind at the moment. They are lost. They're looking very bad. Terrible. In fact, the game was done by halfway through the second quarter, sort of bad. Gold Coast have a great midfield. West Coast don't. More talent in Gold Coast midfield. Dominate stoppage. Dominate field position. They're always going to win this game, the Gold Coast Suns. Two-way wins now for Gold Coast. And I actually think this is the best we've ever seen Gold Coast. Last week, disappointing loss against Melbourne, but they fought against a very good side all the way. Stewie Jew's got the boys playing well. They're looking like a much more well-rounded side. And again, no Tuke Miller, yet they're managing to do really good things out of the middle of the ground. Other players are stepping up. It's good times at Gold Coast. A big win. I think it was their biggest ever away win. Again, it's not a big achievement when it's against a bunch of absolute mugs. But they'll take it and keep building. Gold Coast really starting to get their season rolling. Exciting times for Gold Coast. Number three, Frio hit form at the perfect time. It was an easy win last week against Hawthorne. We go over to Sydney where we haven't won since like 2011, I want to say. Get a big win, even though Sydney aren't in good form, but we'll get to that. And now we've got Geelong next week, who obviously have all those injuries. They're coming off a loss. They're not playing their, be their best footy. So it's a good time to come into form when we've got a hard run of fixtures, Geelong and Melbourne, in the upcoming weeks. The pressure was really high in this game, and I think that's why the ball use was pretty sloppy early. But as soon as we got on top of the midfield battle, the game just started flowing for us. And I think that's what we've really been missing in the early rounds of this season. Last year, a staple of our side was uh, Andy Brayshaw, Caleb Sarong, uh, Will Brody, Dave Mundy. Those guys can get possession of the ball consistently and then give our forwards more chances to kick winning scores which we haven't had really earlier in the season we were getting dominated out of the midfield in games like against the Bulldogs and even North Melbourne but now they've sort of started to click Neil Erasmus comes into the side he's been doing good things Matt Johnson suspended but he could come back into this side these guys are very talented youngsters when they get the run of play we play some really good stuff the handball game handball game which has been very criticised by myself, I must admit, and critics. Starting to look a lot better once we start to flow as an entire unit. Sean Darcy, probably one of his best games at the AFL level, and he has had a lot, but he's looking like an all-Australian ruckman this year. No bias, full bias, in my opinion. He made Tom Hickey look like a first-year player. His strength, he, it just couldn't be matched by Tom Hickey. He had an absolutely mammoth game. I think he had about 44 hitouts and 20 touches. And Luke Jackson, three goals, drifts forward, just uses that athleticism. He'd be so hard to stop in a one-on-one -on -one marking contest without Paddy and Tom McCartan back down there. The Swans didn't really have an answer for it. Luke Jackson, what a game he had. Starting to live up to that that hype and that price tag that people were so critical of only a few months ago. It's always going to take some time to gel into a side as a new player, and he's starting to look really good for us. Lockie Schultz, love him to bits. Plays with his heart on his sleeve every week. Kicked four goals, had a massive game. Amos and Tracy as well, what a game those two had. These kids just need to play together, just 
run it every week. Amos and Tracy, please, because Tracy's a bit of a bull, puts his head over the footy, he's hard at it, took a massive specky on Tom Hickey, and then Amos has just got all that potential, all the class. We need to have these two play like 50 games before we can start actually contending for a premiership. These two need to learn to be a pair as our number one and two key forwards. All round, great performance and a great win for the Fremantle Dockers to keep our season alive. We had to win that game, I feel. I feel like the season was sort of on a pendulum uh, sort of swinging. Will the Swans progress or will Frio? It was a must-win game. And as I said, perfect time to come into form as we have Geelong at home next Saturday night. Now for the Swans, really struggling at the moment. Not too sure what it is. I know they have their the McCartan brothers out and Rampy out, but other than that, nothing too drastic has changed. Buddy isn't really doing too much at the moment. As much of a great player he is, Alex Pierce kept him to no goals. The only real player that stood out for me was Errol Goulden. What a star that kid is. He's like 20 years old and had high 30 disposals, kicked a couple of goals. Absolute superstar. But yeah, the Swans really struggling at the moment. And it's weird to see after, yeah, last year they were a really good side. Losing grand final teams often do slide down. I'm not saying that they won't pick back up later in the season. But yeah, the SCG used to be a fortress. Not so much now. Number four. Horn Francis' decision to leave makes sense. All the criticism, all the booing, all of the media jumping on Jason Horn Francis in the last sort of seven, eight months after he requested a trade from North Melbourne. Put yourself in Jason Horn Francis' shoes. You've been drafted to North Melbourne and the club is an absolute shambles. Like, the fact that they have Alistair Clarkson, one of the best coaches of the century, basically, and he can't even get anything out of this side right now. It's like kicking a dead animal, telling it to get up. North Melbourne, a dead kangaroo, a bit of roadkill on the side of the road. They're just not doing anything at the moment, North Melbourne. The pressure around the ground is woeful. They got about six injuries out of this game as well, which is <laughs> not helping the cause at all. Why would a player of Jason Horn Francis's talent want to stay in a rotting club? Like, it makes sense. It genuinely makes sense. The narrative's been that he's like a spoiled kid or whatever, but they're just shit, North Melbourne. Genuinely, just shit. As much as I like some of their players, and I like Alistair Clarkson, and I want to see North Melbourne do well, they're just so far from it. The culture there just must be rotten. And then you see Horn Francis go to Port Adelaide and play with guys like Butters, Rosie, all these young stars that are hungry, that are playing real good footy. I think Port have won six in a row now. And it's like, why would you not want to be in that environment opposed to North Melbourne? I feel like if Horn Francis got drafted to another Victorian club, he might have stayed. But North Melbourne, I don't think I don't know why any player would want to go there at the moment. I'm looking at you, Griff Logue. A quick break in the nine things we learned to talk about my business, Druzy's Athlete Academy. Druzy's Athlete Academy, obviously in partnership with True Footy for this football season. If you watch these videos and you sort of think, oh yeah, that sounds cool, but I don't really know what it is or how I can commit to Druzy's Athlete Academy, I'm happy to announce I'm doing a one-week free trial. So you can try it before you buy it. For a week, I'll coach you one-on-one -on -one and design a training plan that is specific to your goals to help you achieve your goals given my knowledge as a qualified exercise scientist and strength and conditioning coach. So if you would like to try out Druzy's Athlete Academy for free for the rest of May, you can. I'll leave a link in the description where you can book a free video consult where we can discuss your goals and what sort of training plan you require. Or get in touch at druzy.athleteacademy on Instagram. Together we can discuss your goals and how I can help you achieve them. It's a real no-brainer. One week for free to help you achieve your goals. Druzy's Athlete Academy. Try before you buy. Let's get into the rest of the things. Number five, D's domination party continues. Don't really know how much we learned from this game because it was just like Petrarca, Oliver, Viney, dominate out of the middle, Gorn all around the ground, Van Royen kicking snags, and you look forward lines running well. Like it was just a D's procession, massive win again. They're, out of their last four, their average winning margin is seven goals, which may be a bit skewed because they've played North Melbourne and Hawthorne, but... They're just absolutely loving it at the moment, the Ds. They're playing with confidence. They're absolutely humming. Brody Grundy's fitted perfectly into this side. They're just looking great. Hawthorne, like they, they, can, they can compete, but they're just nowhere near the class of Melbourne, obviously. So no surprises here. Nothing really new learned. The Ds are humming. They're looking really good for the flag this year is all I can say. What more can you say? Number six. Who can match the Lions? Six wins on the bounce now for Brisbane and good wins as well. Other than a slow start due to just inaccuracy in front of goal, the second half was a clinic from Brisbane. And it's no surprise when you look at the quality of players on this list. The stars that can just turn a game on its head and win a game for their side. There's multiple players that can do it. 
in this game. It was Joe Danaher who kicked six goals, had a really good impact. Obviously, shows a lot sometimes. Sometimes he doesn't show up, but it was one of those days against his former club in Essendon. But usually, if it's not him, it can be Charlie Cameron. If it's not him, it's Ashcroft, Neil, Dunkley. The list goes on. Bailey. The list depth in this side just means, like, if one player isn't performing to their potential, you have another superstar that's going to carry them to a victory. At the moment, I don't really see any signs of weakness with this Brisbane side. They are absolutely humming. Even though Essendon put in a decent display for two and a bit quarters, you're just not going to be able to match the Lions for four quarters. Brisbane have got to be a top three flag contender for me, probably alongside Melbourne and Collingwood at the minute. Absolutely flying the Brisbane Lions. Number seven, Dogs had more gears to go. Carlton leaking goals. Carlton had a big fight back in this game, but I always see this happen where a team will fight back, bring it back to within a kick, or they might even get ahead. And then because they've used all that energy to get back to that point, the other team can just run over the top. And that's exactly what we saw happen. I've been saying that the Dogs can play some pretty good four-quarter footy. They definitely lost momentum in this game, but when it mattered late in that fourth quarter, after that Charlie Kerno goal, the Dogs just turned it on. Love seeing Arthur Jones have a massive impact in that last quarter. Runs into space, gets a nice snap, plays up to the crowd, and then I think he hits up Bailey Smith for a goal assist just after that as well, and that pretty much put the game to bed from that point on. The Blues midfield mix, for whatever reason, isn't working. I don't know why. I think you've got all the personnel in the world there that you need. If you can't have a functioning midfield with Cripps, Walsh, and Chera, what is going on there? Colton fans, comment down below what's going on with your side because you're just leaking goals at the moment. Maybe not so much this week, but watching that Brisbane game last week as well, there was that many goals that were just like walking goals, like so easy. So Colton fans, have your say in the comments. What's going on at the Blue Bagger land right now? It's not looking too good. And I think you've got a tough run of fixtures coming up as well. So some form is needed right now. 100% slipping out of the eight, the way it's going. You need to turn your season around ASAP Rocky, bruv. Number eight, the Crow smashed through the impenetrable Saints defense. To think that St. Kilda have been like one of the toughest sides to score against this year for a lot of teams, for Adelaide to just come in and absolutely pump St. Kilda speaks volumes to the potential and the talent that this Crow's list has. They are absolutely smashing it. From start to finish, they were just all over it, relentless, didn't stop the whole game. They kicked more than four goals in every quarter, which you're just never going to keep up with. Doesn't matter whether you're Collingwood or Melbourne or whoever it is. Maybe maybe Collingwood or Melbourne could keep up with the Crows. <laughs> in fact, Collingwood just did get over the Crows. That's not the point. The point I'm making is if you're kicking four goals a quarter, you're absolutely flying. Rankin, Rochelle, love and watching those two play in particular, but Jordan Dawson, Saligo, the, there's players all over the park now. They're looking like a really well-rounded side, the Crows. They're so well-drilled. They're so competitive. Nothing new learned about that, but I'm just really enjoying watching the Crows play right now. From a Saints perspective, you probably just hope that it's a blip on the radar. It's just one of those days. Not trying to throw the baby out of the bathwater yet, as Justin Longmuir would say. Don't want to get too carried away with this result. Although, you know, a belting away from home is never nice. So, for Saints fans, you'll be hoping that it's just a nothing game. Move on. But, that impenetrable defence just got found out. So, other teams could understand how to crack open the Saints. Overall, great win for the Crows. And number nine, Pies flying high. Cox has a biannual great game. Pye is sitting on the top of the ladder, playing with confidence. Just always so great to watch Collingwood. As much as you hate them, take your bias off and just watch them play football because they are absolutely great. You want to know a great footballer? Mason Cox said no one ever, maybe twice a year. He had one of those games, you know, 2018 prelim sort of stuff from Mason Cox. 19 disposals. I think he had about nine marks, 25 hit it. Like, massive game from Mason Cox. And they've really been missing that high at Collingwood. So for him to come back into the side, have a massive game, it's only going to strengthen Collingwood. You know, they only usually win by about one to two goals every week. It is every week, but it is only usually <laughs> a short margin. But to have Mason Cox come back in makes a massive impact. Whether or not he's he has great skill as a footballer, just having that height is very impactful. And I mean, what more can you say about this game? Collingwood are always going to beat GWS at the MCG. Goey having a good game. Dacos having a good game. Tom Mitchell, like, it's the same thing every week. They're just having an absolute bath of a time <laughs> at the moment. Collingwood stars all over the park playing great footy. Top of the ladder. Colt next week should be light work. And that's going to wrap up nine things we learned for round nine. But before you go, roll it back. Come here. 
and like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Druzy's Athlete Academy, free trial. Get on it. Link in the description. You can organize a free video call with me to discuss your goals and let me help you with your training. Keep it locked to the True Footy channel, and I shall see you next week for 9 Things We Learned. Until then, take care, you plonkers.